Hello, this is Hamlet, and this is my Goal Challenge Mode Guide to Iron Docks. There are a variety of ways you can collect the 44 enemies required in this zone. We're going to take a pretty straightforward route, essentially killing everything on the main path. We're going to start with these first two packs right in front of the entrance, along with that Battlemaster that got pulled in from the left, and we start our usual AoE stun and AoE DPS rotation. The Battlemaster can't be stunned, but everything else can. He is the most important mob because of his blade storms, especially if you have melee DPS. Nothing else is extremely important, but the incinerators will put a magical dot on people called Incendiary Slug that you can dispel. It's not a huge amount of damage, so dispelling it might not be as critical as healing the tank, but it can be worth spending a GCD on if you catch it right when it appears. The Dead Eyes can cast Leg Shot, which snares someone heavily, and the Foot Soldiers will charge someone for a small physical dot and can use Demoralizing Roar, which nullifies everyone's next three attacks, reducing your DPS. Range can outrange that, and you can also try to stop the cast. After using most of our cooldowns there, we're going to move on to pull the next pack alone, which includes the first named mob, Champion Druna. She regularly has the archers up on the ledge rain burning arrows down on the party, which causes everyone to have to move a little bit and is slightly annoying to deal with if you're dealing with a lot of other mobs at the same time. We're going to try to work her down quickly uh, while watching Siege Master Oligar come around the corner into pull range. We'll pull him now, but we delay a little bit until she's basically dead, so we generally don't have to deal with them at the same time. Olugar does a melee stomp shattering strike, which melee have to back away from slightly. He will also occasionally throw his axe to a location where it'll spin for a little while. As long as the melee know to look out for shattering strike, he is generally a pretty easy mob. If you are looking to pull a few extra mobs than we did here to skip a pack later, then you can probably do them while you're fighting Olugar. We're going to take a momentary combat break after killing him and then move on to pull the four pack on the right side of the boss's room right here. It's three mobs you've seen before and a technician. The technician has a few randomly targeted ranged attacks that you have to heal off, including one explosive AoE so people shouldn't stand on each other. In addition, he sometimes throws vials of grease, which put a grease puddle on the ground under you, which stun you for one second anytime you use any ability, so long as you're standing in it. So people have to watch to move out of them quickly and then resume doing what they were doing. As the Battlemaster dies, we're going to pull two more technicians that are in this right-hand corner of the room for kill count purposes. This is going to bring us up to 17 mobs before the boss, which is the minimum you need to have before moving on with the zone. There's a pack of three right near the end of the zone that has another Siege Master in it that you can walk past, so if you don't want to fight them, you would pull three more mobs on the way through this hallway, probably around the time you were fighting Oligar. As it is, we finish off these last two technicians while we get into position for the first boss. You can consider pulling them right into the boss if you want, depending on how you want to time your potions and other things. As you can see, we're just about three minutes in from the start of the zone, so we're going to be pulling this boss with three minute DPS timers, bloodlust, and DPS potions to kill him very quickly. He's generally not a very difficult boss. You burn down this wolf first, and you focus fire the wolf Dreadfang down, even after Fleshrender Nutgar jumps off, and then you just have to deal with him. Dreadfang will die reasonably quickly and won't do all that much. He sometimes does savage mauling, fixating a person and damaging them over the course of 6 seconds, but it's not very lethal. Once Nokgar jumps off, his most important ability is Reckless Provocation. It has a long cast you have to watch for, and then he puts a very visible red shield around himself that lasts for 5 seconds. Any attack done to him while the shield is up will cause the attacker to get feared for quite a long time. There it goes. If you have a Tremor Totem, you can completely ignore the first one, although ours doesn't go off here for some reason, so a bunch of people are feared for a while. We're still going to kill him before the second one. Being feared is very bad, because there's a lot of fire on the ground from his other important ability, these burning arrows. It does quite a lot of damage, and if you're feared in it, you can very easily die. Otherwise, though, all you have to do is dodge the burning arrows in between fears, and the fight is not very hard. If you don't have a shaman, you'll have to be very careful to deal with the first shield and have everyone in the party know to look out for it, but hopefully you can still kill him before the second one, making it a reasonably quick fight. Once this dies, you're going to mount up and run over to the room with the three iron stars. If you're a druid, you want to be a little careful not to leave hots taking on the tank while you're mounted up, because the tank is about to go 
aggro these large ogron, and what you don't want is aggro to come onto you. The way you want this to work is that the tank leads first while everyone is mounted, and these two ogron will chase him all the way to the iron stars, and then some DPS will try to run ahead and throw the first iron star to kill these two big ogron right when they get there. Meanwhile, two other people will send the other two iron stars down the hallway, with everyone following behind them. None of the mobs you just killed count, and that's regardless of whether or not you kill them with iron stars. The next mobs that do count are a pack of three deckhands that patrol between where we turn this corner and the entrance to the gauntlet, and we're going to pull them together with the Ogron pack at the start of the gauntlet using army. If you don't have army, this might be a very high damage pack to try to pull all at once. We're going to use DPS potions and cooldowns to try to finish them during army. Deckhands do a lot of randomly targeted damage with Hatchet Toss. It does about 60,000 to someone and leaves a significant physical dot on them. If you do pull this together, then you'll have five of those Deckhands, a Chain Master that increases their attack speed, and the big Ogron that occasionally AoEs. You can use stuns or other CCs to also try to keep this all under control, but without an army they don't last nearly as long and it might be very hectic to try to heal off all of this during the amount of time that they're left active before you can kill them. One other option people do is to drag all of this back around the corner and try to kill them with an iron star, but that takes a lot of work to try to orchestrate. You have to leave it up while running around the corner, aggro all this, and then get back around the corner with someone to use the star without everyone dying in the process. Deckhands also leave those swirling axes moving around on the ground, so it's a little hectic when you have five of them going at once for your melee DPS. Once you get those mobs down, regardless of how you do it, you're going to be left with this Ogron laborer, and what you want to do is move him into the gauntlet and then spin around so that he's in it and you're not. Then next time Skulluck rains his barrage down on this side of the hallway, you're going to get some free damage on the laborer. It looks like we didn't quite get it started for very long this time, but it's a little bit of free damage before we head across. It's going to be more important to do that for the trash packs coming up in the gauntlet, since a lot of them hit pretty hard, and getting the freebie DPS on them is a big advantage. This pack coming around the corner is two more deckhands and a chain master that we're just familiar with, and a technician like from the beginning of the zone. The party can be safe as long as you tuck into the alcove behind this box, and and if you have a way of getting the mobs stuck out in the cannon fire, you're going to get the free damage. For example, stunning them there right at the moment the fire starts so they stay out there for a few seconds. Gorfin's Grasp and Typhoon and other similar abilities can help you position them. You generally want to kill the Chain Master first because it buffs the rest of the party and otherwise simply deal with the deckhands, hatchet tosses, and floating axes. Once this pack is under control, you're going to want to pull the Ogron Laborer that's standing behind the next box so you can start getting it tanked and having it stand out here in the hallway fighting you so that you get free damage on it from Skullux Barrage. As soon as there's a gap, you can move across behind the box where the laborer was so you can get ready to pull the next pack. Uh, we try to position the laborer so he's still out in the hallway, but it looks like he took an extra step this time. It's not the biggest deal. Um, the damage from the barrage is noticeable, but it's not critical in order to be able to kill the mobs quickly. As soon as there's a gap to move across the hallway to the right, you're going to deal with this final pack with a technician, a battle master, and two flame singers. The flame singers are cast and don't move very much on their own, so if you have a way of moving them, they'll just sit out in the hallway very easily. For the other two mobs, ideally you have a way of keeping them out there like I described before. As at the beginning of the zone, try to kill the Battlemaster quickly because he's the one that can tend to be most deadly. Nothing else here is really too big of a deal. Handle the technician like you did before and watch out for the burning arrows from the flame singer. Once you're out of combat and you run around this box ahead of us, the barrage will stop and the second boss will spawn. You will get a brief break as they run down the ramp. Um, for your healer to drink and things like that, and for everyone to run into position. The upcoming boss is not very intense healing-wise. Most of the damage is avoidable. It's mostly just an exercise in killing the mobs efficiently uh, through Ariok's Sanguine Shield. Here someone gets aggro on two of them and dies instantly at the start, but other than stuff like that, people won't be taking very much damage. They should know how to dodge the bombs, they should dodge the flame wave, and the tank can aim the direction of Macog's Flame Slash, so just Whatever kind of positioning you decide, just make sure people know where that's going and are coordinated. 
The most important ability of the fight is Ariak's Sanguine Sphere, which you'll start to cast once any party member gets low. It lasts 15 seconds, it's a shield on the target, and if it gets broken, the entire party gets healed up substantially, which you absolutely can't have happen. So it means that whichever target you are burning down first, you will have to stop when Sanguine Sphere appears on them. This essentially forces you to split your DPS some. Your goal is to kill Ariak as quickly as possible because the spheres are the only things that slow down your DPS on this fight but you are continually forced to switch off of her for that reason and so depending on how bursty your dps is you might wind up dpsing them all down somewhat more evenly as you can see she keeps it up on herself pretty regularly you can try to put a lot of effort into timing it or timing a burst or baiting a sphere onto someone else or various other tactics but it's not even necessarily a big deal because depending on your comp you may be able to dps three targets quite efficiently and not have a particular need to want to kill one of them as quickly as possible Nothing in the fight is so hectic that you have to get them down in order to keep the fight under control. But the faster you get her down, the faster the spheres will stop happening, so it's still a good thing. While she's alive, you can interrupt Blood Bolt to cut down on damage a little bit. It's not really a big deal, but it's something you can do with free interrupts while people are DPSing her. Once she's dead, then you don't have to worry about Sphere anymore, and everyone can just DPS two targets as efficiently as possible, although in our case they died at the same time because we had kept switching off for Sanguine Sphere. Once it's only Macog left, he's quite harmless, so you just want to get him down as quickly as possible. The only abilities left at this point are the Lava Sweep and the Flaming Slash. And if you're standing on the ramp like two of us are here, you don't even have to move for the Lava Sweep. It just passes harmlessly underneath you. And then that means that you really pretty much never have to move and you can just stand inside the circle of traps the entire time. It makes it quite easy. As we finish off the boss, I'm just going to mention that we're going to clear all the trash between here and the end of the zone. Um, you can skip some or all of this final trash hallway through some combination of invising if you choose to. And another possibility is to simply run mounted all the way to the boss's room and die if you have a way of resing, such as a soul stone. Some people do that to skip all the trash. I didn't work out whether it was faster to kill some of the easier mobs at the beginning of the zone and then do all that and deal with resing and rebuffing and not being able to use potions as much and things like that. Um, it might save a little time, but it seemed like it would be a lot of work to learn extra skipping tricks and they're really not necessary in order to get the gold time in this zone. You can do it just fine on the basic straightforward path killing the mobs. So that first trash pack was a cleft hoof and a wrangler. This one is a cleft hoof and two wranglers. Cleft hooves are pretty straightforward. They occasionally charge out and do an AoE that knocks someone up in the air. You can leave them for last. Wranglers are a little more annoying. They will disengage and leave piles of caltrops on the ground. The caltrops do a significant amount of damage as long as you're standing in them, and they also can be kind of hard to see, which is the bigger problem. Otherwise, they do some randomly targeted damage in a dot. It's nothing too scary. We pulled them all separately. If we had wound up needing to save more time, we probably could have combined those first two packs. Make sure people stay a bit spread out at range so that you're not caught in the charge when the cleft hoof charges at other people. And there's uh, an example of caltrops on the ground so that you can have some idea what they look like. The next pack coming up is going to have a flame spitter along with a wrangler. The flame spitter leaves a lot of fire all over the place on the ground, so you generally want to kill it first. And you probably, if you're trying to do this hallway faster, might not try to combine it with other packs. It just becomes a pain because you have to move around a lot, and it does do quite a lot of damage if you touch it. It dies pretty quickly though, so just focus it down first and then deal with the wrangler, just like in the packs before it. Um, you can see caltrops on the ground again there, along with the fire. You have to be extra careful when you're trying to move out of the fire at the same time, not to touch them. They do a lot of damage and slow you down quite a lot. The pack at the top of the ramp has one of each of the three kinds of mobs, a wrangler, a rylak, and a cleft hoof. If you're the healer, watch LOS as your tank runs up over the top of the ramp to pull. You might lose them for a second, so just make sure to stay right up there with them. This pack is generally not any harder than the ones before it. As usual, you're going to want to take down the flame spitter first to deal with the fire as quickly as possible, but really like with anything else in, in challenge mode, you're going to want to do the most efficient AoE DPS. Uh, dots and clones and all of that stuff, but bring the flame spitter down first as you can. The pack in this next room is a three pole that includes a siege master with the same abilities as the one at the beginning of the zone. It's easy to run right past it because of the way it patrols on either side of these boxes. Uh, you may have to wait a little bit. There will be some RNG there if you choose to do that. Otherwise, you can just fight it. 
Um, it's a technician and a battle master and a siege master. So melee have to be very careful because there's both the blade storm and the siege master's shattering strike. Our monk actually took a few seconds to run over into the boss's room to start the RP for Oshir so that when we get there we can simply pull him. It may be a little faster to simply pull three more mobs into your routine in the first room of the instance and then walk past these guys, but we weren't sure and we didn't want to deal with the patrol RNG of waiting for them to get into position to run by them. Um, it may have been a little faster, especially since we had the death there, but either way, I'm going to go and move ahead into the boss's room pretty soon so that I'm in position to drink and get ready to pull the boss as they finish the mobs and then run right in and pull the boss with no delay because we've already triggered the RP. Oshir is not a very hard boss. You mostly just want to kill him quickly so that you have to kill as few waves of adds as possible. Something to think about here is splitting up your DPS potions and timers and things between Oshir and Skullock, the final boss. You can probably use two sets of three minute cooldowns, one on Oshir and one near the end of Skullock, and a total of three DPS potions. A pre-pot here, a pre-pot on Skullock, and then a second pot on Skullock. You'll also have Bloodlust for one of the two, although it probably makes more sense to use it on Skullock. The first adds Oshir breaks out will always be Wolves. They fixate on everyone in the party. The best way to deal with them is to get a stun on them the instant they pop out of the cage before they all spread out everywhere. We did it with Leg Sweep. If you have a follow-up stun, that's good too. They'll likely be dead before that's all done with. You can also have the group clump up a little bit and then they won't spread out very far. They do some damage, but not too much because they die so fast. When Oshir uses time to feed, people just DPS him quickly to break it. Um, it'll do some damage that you have to heal off, but it shouldn't be enough to kill somebody. You want to have Oshir low when he summons his second add, which is the Rylock. If you have him really low, you might be able to ignore the Rylock and kill him, which is good for speed. It depends also on where Oshir jumps. If you're unlucky and he jumps very far away, you're not going to be able to keep burning him efficiently in order to focus him down, and you're going to lose time running back towards Skullock, like what happens here. With 28%, we decide to kill the Rylock. Another possibility is to CC it, depending on what you have. We probably could have paralyzed it, but it has very little HP, and we only need to get one interrupt off, and we didn't lose much time. You do have to interrupt the Rylock when it's alive. Its cast that puts acid pools under everyone is very annoying, but if it's really low, then you might be able to just interrupt him once while finishing off the fight by killing Oshir. A second time defeat here is no big problem since the target of time defeat can continue DPSing and nothing really changes. As soon as Oshir is dead from wherever in the room you wound up having him after his jump, everyone in the group is going to mount up and run right over to engage Skullock. If you can kill Skullock before the third cannon barrage, then the fight is going to take about 2 minutes and 15 seconds. If your DPS is very good, you can kill Skullock before the second cannon barrage by focusing him down completely, which helps because even if the adds are still alive, then you can kill them without getting knocked back and wasting time. We're going to kill Koromar first, though, and still easily be able to kill him before the third one. It's nice to kill Koromar because if Koromar is alive once cannon barrage happens, he will be blade storming down the hallway as you're trying to run back. And it's not that hard to avoid, but it's just an unnecessary risk. Your three minute timers and things will be down from Oshir. They'll probably be back up for the second phase of Skullock, and that makes that a good time to bloodlust too, but you can still kill Koromar before the first knockback if you focus him. Dealing with Cannon Barrage, you want to use whatever speed boost you have to get to this left box. Uh, in the first step and then go right to the boss. You can't make those runs safely with no speed boost, but you probably have something in your group. If you have a Stampeding Roar, if you have Warlock, Portals, Pack, lots of various things can get you to the left box safely, and then lots of classes can move very quickly to the boss. As long as any one person gets to the boss, then he'll stop doing Cannon Barrage. The boss will aggro that person, but as long as the tank is right on their heels, the person who interrupted him can move backwards while the tank moves up to take him up and start the next phase. If Koromar is dead, then Sogash will be out when you get back. He's completely meaningless. You just want to focus your DPS on Skullock, and Zogash should die to any minor incidental secondary target damage. The goal is to make sure you get Skullock down in this phase and the next one. Um, your timers will be back up here. We should have used Bloodlust here in this phase at the same time. I think something happened and we didn't have it up due to some irregularity earlier, so we have to use it after the second knockback. The second knockback goes the same way. I use Stampede for a speed boost. 
boost. As soon as the first wave of barrage ends, our monk is going to flying serpent kick up to activate the boss, and the tank is right behind him to pick him up. And we do bloodlust here, which wasn't the, exactly the ideal time, but it, it doesn't wind up mattering. We have more than enough time to finish him off before the next barrage, and Zogosh is going to die in there as well. If you're not killing him before the third cannon barrage, you may have to focus him harder at the beginning, even if it means leaving Koromar up longer. And think about how you time your bloodlust, which you can use any time if you only use it on the first boss, with your 3 minute DPS cooldowns, which will come back up sometime after you use them at Oshir. And there we kill it with about 30 seconds to go, a healthy cushion on this pretty straightforward route that I think should be an effective way to learn the zone for anyone who's looking for gold. So good luck, and thank you for watching.